Well, hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Brand Builder Show. And today we're going to be talking about how to build a successful brand. We've got Daniela on the show today and uh, she's got some exciting brands that she's been working on, which we're going to talk about and then a whole load of brand optimization stuff that we'll geek out on as well. Daniela, welcome to the show today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it's an honor to have you. Uh, I asked you before we start recording where you're from, and obviously, if you could tell the audience, that would be great. Sure. Oh, I'm actually from California. Grew up there, then lived in Chicago for eight years, and um, more recently have become a transplant to Peru and South America. As I said to you before we started recording, I feel like that is definitely the most exotic uh, location of a podcast guest so far. You know, all the other guys, I love them. You know, the guys and girls, I love them, bless them, you know. But they come from boring places like Florida oh. and Chicago. And, you know, oh. but I'm, I, Chicago is definitely not boring. If anybody <laughs> from Chicago is listening, I love Chicago. Chicago for me was the first place that felt like home, even though I grew up in, in SoCal. I love Chicago. To be fair, I've only spent two hours in Chicago. and Oh, it was, you're missing uh, out. There was so much snow that we actually slid sideways in the Boeing airplane as it taxied down the runway. So I do oh, have wow. you know, some memories of Chicago, but uh, <laughs> it was just the first location that came to mind. Maybe but, a little bit um, frightening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's great to have you here. And uh, I'm excited for all we're going to talk through on the show today. And uh, But I'd love for you to kind of catch us up. What have you been up to over the recent years? What has got you to the point of your e-commerce expertise that you carry? Share a bit of that with sure. us and, uh, and then we'll dive into the topic. Sure. So in a nutshell, I'm the founder of Mindful Goods, which is a listing optimization service where we help brands um, improve their creative and their content for Amazon. So everything from graphics, SEO on their product pages and on their storefronts. Um, we serve, we service at this point about 150 brands every year. Awesome. Um, and we do that with a team of 12 freelancing females, which I'm very proud of. Um, and it's a bunch of women that come together and support these brands to optimize their, their product pages. And right now, over 50% of our brands are seeing increases in sales from 60 to 600 percent so Very cool. that's um pretty proud of that at the moment yeah absolutely was the female um led side of it was that something that you consciously went about to build pretty much yeah, yeah. um i formerly before this i had a tech startup and we had investors and i went that whole route and um it showed me a different side of things and i realized that for me personally, that wasn't the way I wanted to build a business. And um, I think we've come into an era now where people can pick up their laptops and work from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I did have um, a very fortunate uh, circumstance where I was able to work for another tech company after exiting my own. And I got to see how they ran a remote environment and how I thrived in that environment. And I just thought, you know, if, if I could do it all over again, that's what I'm going to do. And so that's what I did. Yeah, awesome. Very cool. <laughs> and you've got a couple or you've got some e-commerce brand kind of um, journey of, of your own. Can you talk to us a bit about that as well? Sure. Yeah. So um, in in creating Mindful Goods and helping brands, um, you know, it's always been a passion of mine to launch my own products. So I have a jigsaw puzzle brand in the States and we do sell that on Amazon and nice. on our own D2C website on Shopify. Cool. And that one's called lostwalls.com. And then here in Peru, I got the itch again. And uh, with my husband, we started a tortilla chip company. So cool. that one is not sold online. It is basically just sold in gourmet shops around um, Peru. Very cool. What makes a good tortilla chip? Um, making it with organic non-GMO corn mm -hmm. and handmade tortillas and mm -hmm. um, making sure you're using the best quality materials. Um, here, actually, fun fact, and the reason why we decided to start this business is um, if you grew up in the States, tortilla chips are normal. Um, you find them at every single grocery store, salted and unsalted. Here in Peru, they don't exist. People don't know what a tortilla chip they're, they were They're made in Mexico. Wow. Peruvians, is they don't even know what a tortilla chip is. They actually call tortilla chips nachos, which if you know Mexican food, nachos is the actual chips with the cheese Ish. and the meat and all yeah. that stuff on top. So um, our brand is actually called Shaka Nachos, funny enough. <laughs> did, um, did you have any sort of unique challenges with it being a food-based thing? Um, 
In what way? No, not really. Yeah, like manufacturing, like obviously, I don't know how what it's like in Peru, but if you make something that's edible in the States or in Europe, there's so many certifications, testing, all those kind of challenges that often put people off a consumable. You'd be surprised here. It's actually um, very easy. Um, and I was fortunate that, you know, I have a family, my family has a catering business here. So they have a facility where we were able to just get up and running really quickly. And um, the rest of it, which was harder to navigate is um, that I'm not fluent in Spanish and I didn't grow up here. So um, for me, learning the lingo of business talk here and and culturally how you do business here was probably the hardest part Mm. Um, because in the States, you know, I know how to, how things work. Whereas here it's, it's, it's a little bit different. So um, that's been the harder part is understanding how the culture works here. Sure. And with a lot of your business taking place in the States, how have you found that not living there? How have I found what? Uh, you, you've got a lot of business happening in the States, you, mm-hmm. you know, your brand, your your clients, et cetera. You're not living in the States. How have you found that that dynamic? Yeah, that's interesting, right? Because I've always advised clients on how they should be handling their e-commerce businesses based on mm-hmm. what we see working well with across all of our clients, right? And mm-hmm. so when it came to launching the puzzles, for instance, I literally forced myself to take my own advice every step of the way so that I could hold myself accountable to all the advice that we were giving. And one of those things was initially, do you keep product in your house and ship it yourself? Or do you use something like Amazon FBA and use that to ship to clients from an Amazon warehouse direct to them? And so what I realized is not only do I need Amazon FBA, but I need another warehouse as well. And so I, I got those up and running immediately um, from day one. Well, I was never shipping out a, a puzzle out of my own house. And what that allowed me to do was focus more on marketing and actually run my own business the way that I intended to, right? Like yeah. I don't spend, I spend 90% of my time on Mindful Goods helping other brands. I don't mm-hmm. spend nearly enough time focused on my own brands because the way that I view my brands is that I'm slowly growing them over time and I'm not trying to just, you know, pump and dump a bunch of cash in there and make a quick buck. You know, I'm looking at those as, as long-term brands that are going to provide other revenue streams in the future. Yeah, definitely. No, that's cool. Very cool. I I love the, the fact of you know doing them both together you know I, i'm the same we do sort of like the um, content stuff podcast etc and then you know, do some on the brand side as well and i think that uh it helps you stay really sharp but at the same time i totally get what you're saying because it's so easy for you a to like teach all of the best principles but then get a little bit lazy when you actually implement yeah. it uh, and then b you know run out of time you know as entrepreneurs we take on so many things it's trying to spin plates at times isn't it but um how, how do you deal with that sort of uh, overwhelm or or maybe you don't struggle with it. Maybe it's just me. But do you feel like you're kind of having to prioritize? And, and how do you prioritize between those? It's funny. I was I, I was just talking about this with somebody else the other day, too, is that I think it's an issue of delegation rather than um, anything else, right? Because yeah. we, we think we're busy, but the reality is that we're still trying to do everything ourselves or take or we take it on ourselves as opposed to giving it to those around us or finding someone around us who can possibly do some of the work so that you don't feel that heavy burden. And maybe that heavy burden is a good thing for you to experience and realize, oh, okay, it's time for me to delegate again. Right. And, and then looking, cause I, every, every week you could look at your list and it gets longer and longer. And if it keeps getting longer and longer, it means you're not delegating. So I've had to basically teach myself this. Um, I don't know if, if you had the same experience, but, um, growing up in the States, I had a really interesting perspective when I would come visit family in Peru and see how my siblings who grew up in Peru um, tackle things as they were entering adulthood. Um, we in the States are taught if something needs to be done, you do it. So laundry needs to be done, you do it. Dishes need to be done, you do it. Um, your parents teach you how to do these things, right? So you can uh, take care of yourself when you eventually move out of the house, hopefully a young age. Um, children in Peru, they don't move out of the house a lot of times or oftentimes at a, at a young age, 18, they, they stay many more years. Um, it allows them to end up buying a house, um, in their adult life and, and all of these other things, right? Culturally, it's just very different. But in addition, a lot of wealthier families or even middle class families grew up with help in the house. And so the kids are not taught to do it for themselves. They're taught to delegate. And that's a totally different skill. And it is a skill that we need to practice in order to become Mm. 
good at it and to remember that it's not all about doing, it's about doing and delegating and understanding when is the right time to do versus delegate mm-hmm. so that you don't end up overwhelmed and, and burnt out and stressed. And I yeah. saw that with my siblings where I was able to talk to them about their business, ask them, you know, um, they said they wanted to do, you know, um, a new product and they had all these ideas and da, da, da. And I was like, okay, great. So how are you going to do the graphic design? Like, oh, we already got somebody. Okay. How are you going to do this? Oh, we already got some. It was never like, oh, I worked on these ideas on my computer and here's what I'm, no, no, no. Oh, I got somebody working on that. I got somebody working on that. And just the way that they were just like, nope, I found somebody to do that. They're, they're just on it, you know? Yeah. So what would you say? What would you say to the control freaks that like to have everything perfect? Um, Good luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good I've, I've, good that's, answer. that's been a, that's been a, a, a hard one for me to learn. Cause there was pieces mm. of my business where I thought I was the only one that could do it. Yeah. Um, at first I thought I could, I was the only one who could do our mini audits that mm. are on our website right now, where like I look at the listing, I give you all the top level, like here's how we would handle your listing A to Z. Yeah. Here's all the things I recommend. And then I realized I have this incredibly talented team of creative directors that watch all my videos, that know exactly, that took my mini course, that know, ex- that, that have their own ideas of how they would approach that specific brand. Yeah. And wow, I can tap into them and their talents. And oftentimes they do an even better job than me at doing those mini audits. So I've now realized if they can do that, the thing that I thought I had to do forever, then mm. there's, you know, the world is abundant. There's so many people out there that can help you in every single capacity of your business. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, loads more we could talk about on that, but I do want to get into some Amazon stuff. And Let's that's do a good, it. Um, good segue into it with your uh, <laughs> talk. Of it. I, I, do, I want to get back to that. You, you talked about doing a mini audit, so I'd love to talk about what you look for in a minute. But the, the first thing is just a, more of a yeah. timely thing. Um, I mentioned to you before the episode talking about the review changes that Amazon are doing right now. And yeah. for anybody that's listening that's not sure what that means is Amazon are really changing the way – the review count, the review badges, look in search results. It used to be all five stars highlighted, however many were um, it was. If it was five stars, all full, 4.5, four and a half were full. Mm -hmm. And then also the review count, you know, the numbers. Um, So it would be like if it was a four digit uh, review count, that would all show five digit would all show. Whereas they tested a lot of things, it feels like in the last couple of weeks, just showing one star and the number rating next to it. And -hmm. just that and then they've also added in the count. But sometimes if it's, you know, 1000, it might be 1k rather than the four numbers. And just it might sound like little things. But I've noticed on my end, it has actually impacted click-through rate on our highest review count items Mm. Um, and so the newer items uh, we just recently launched a product hardly got any reviews but it's coming right out the gate and we're getting 20 sales a day and it's great but for the more established products with loads of reviews we're seeing a um, a drop i looked at my stats in the last two weeks we've had a 25 percent drop in the click-through rate of our uh, one of our main products And so the traffic's down and I only put that down really to the change because it did have quite a good review moat um, Mm -hmm. initially in search results. Um, That's the the big thing that I put it down to. But you're saying that you haven't really seen as much of that with your clients. What's your kind of take on what's going on? I think that's what you would expect to see, right? Like you would expect for for the reviews to be, um, I mean, it's kind of a good thing if you think about it because initially everyone's just trying to get to page one, but there's so many great products beyond page one. And I think as a shopper, when you think about, um, looking at page one, I kind of feel like I'm looking at the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. And I, I bet you Amazon's trying to get away from that, right? They're trying to give everyone a fair play yeah. at, at grabbing the attention based on having a different product, mm. right? Like I don't want to look at 20 of the same product. I'm looking mm. for a very specific thing. And even though I'm searching in the search box for a very specific thing, sometimes it doesn't even show me that. An example yeah. this week, I was looking for a, um, I don't even know what kind of travel bag it was, but I was looking for a travel bag that was neoprene material. Okay. And specifically, I wanted neoprene material. What showed up on page one? Zero. It was like one one out of all the options was neoprene. Yeah. When that was the specific thing that I was putting in. Why? Because all of these brands are putting the word neoprene in the back end of their listing, and then they're mm-hmm. just pumping sales, and they're getting all these reviews and showing up at the top, yeah. right? And so I bet you Amazon is seeing that data and trying to figure out a way that they can allow new entry-level brands to compete a little bit more. And that's what's been so great about Amazon from day one is the fact that these smaller up-and-coming brands can actually rival the big Mm -hmm. Procter & Gamble brands of the world, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think you are, you've nailed it. It is so good for new brands, new products. There was talk of them doing something like this a few years ago, and I thought, gosh, if that ever happens, that's going to be a big blow to the the old stalwarts, you know, that have been there a long time with their big review mm. moat because um, that's so much of what drives their sales. But this does... Yeah open up the playing field and i've said that to our community is like this is the time to launch a product because you've got less of that challenge there and you've got mm. more opportunity and yeah i agree it's a great play from amazon because otherwise it's just products from seven eight years ago that have never been uh, improved because nobody wants to have to create a new listing so they just mm -hmm. either don't improve it or completely change the product and use the same listing which is kind of against terms of service and you know so there's, there's lots going on there isn't there but yeah I, I think it's really positive for new sellers new products yeah, there's actually a few other updates that, that I've seen recently as well. No, Have you seen the um, image stack testing in Amazon Experiments? No. Uh, so if you have a parent ASIN without any mm -hmm. variants, any child, um, so variations mm -hmm. in that same listing, and you do an Amazon Experiment, which is a free tool for brands that have brand registry, mm -hmm. um, so you can split test different content. Um, now you can, you can split test image stack. So all of, pro all of your product images against your original, oh. your new product images against your original product images. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Very that, cool. That's massive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a big one. Another one I saw this week is, um, a pilot, uh, well, the Amazon creator program is now mm. being released to more and more accounts so mm. that brands can actually go inside. It's inside the, the advertising panel. So you probably, mm. if you're listening to this, you want to check and see if you have access. Not all brands have access. Um, but it'll say, um, uh, creator program, something like that. And within there, you can actually work with different Amazon creators who will post on their social medias, um, your product, little videos or photos of your product, and they will get a commission from Amazon and from you if you want to give them an extra commission, which is amazing, right? Because some mm -hmm. of the top brands on Amazon have run their own affiliate programs completely separate from Amazon. And what they, like one of the top olive oil companies, for instance, they told me firsthand what they were doing from day one is only working with influencers. And they were telling them, whatever Amazon is paying you for your commission, we'll double it. And some months they would triple it. And some months, some months they would do even more than that and give big bonuses yeah. um, to get them to be long-term brand ambassadors yeah. for the brand. And that's how, that's the only thing they did to consistently stay top three on Amazon. Yeah. I think it's a great tip. We've just started actually reaching out to a bunch of different like bloggers and influencers in our niches to try and do a, a similar thing because we've tried uh, rather unsuccessfully in the past to get them just to be an affiliate to our own website. Mm -hmm. But when you combine it with Amazon, because they love the conversion rate of Amazon, you know, you send traffic to Amazon, it converts so well. Amazon will pay them on not just the, your product that they buy, but whatever they buy in a 24 hour period. So mm -hmm. they love Amazon, but the, com the actual commission rate is not great. So yeah, we're doing that, trying to offer them an extra bonus on top of it so that they'll prioritize our products but also get that amazon goodness as well so i think um yeah some real exciting opportunities coming up with amazon they, yeah. they continue to innovate aren't they it's um i think they're getting time. ready for their conference they're going to release a bunch of updates for their conference that's what i'm seeing yeah yeah definitely definitely no it's exciting so the, you would do a mini audit you said on, on a listing um let's yeah. kind of play through one for, for a moment the client sends you a listing you go and look through it what are the most common things right now in 2023 you are seeing that sellers are still getting wrong and are the major needle movers for bigger sales okay there's a few of the getting wrongs um that i'll just highlight up front um yeah. one of the things that i still see today is having the same image in the product images just rotated at a different angle. So like taking a product on white image, turning it like this, then turning it like this. <laughs> um, we need to get more creative than that. That's not gonna get people to stay engaged with your content. And remember Amazon is tracking every single thing that happens once a shopper's on your page, even before, I mean, obviously before they get into your page. So every single interaction matters. So. With that in mind, we want to con we want to make remember that every image needs to serve a function, right? So the way that I look at a listing overall is three steps. Um, the first step is how do you get found through your SEO, mm -hmm. and so that you show up in those search results, right? The second step is once we're showing up in the search results, aside from reviews, which we know is big, aside from your offer, which you can you can flex a little bit up and down. Um, how else do we get them to click on your listing versus your competitors, right? And assuming we've done those first two steps, once they're inside of our listing, what else can we do to get them to convert? 
Like what, what is, what are the yeah. things that we can do? Right. So yeah. that first piece, looking at your SEO, what I don't want to see if I'm looking at your listing is I don't want to see over the top keyword stuffing. I want it to make sense for me, but I also don't want to see not using all the characters. Like you'd be surprised how many titles just have like eight words. And I'm like, why? Wow. This is crazy. And then, um, bullets. We actually just did a, our first Amazon experiment bullet test because I just thought it was funny and didn't think that it would matter to do one. Um, because you know, bullets are secondary to title and you just, you know, it's just kind of, why would you test that when you could test a main image or a plus content and other things that seem to impact things more. But yeah. one test that we just did showed 500% increase in sales by changing what? the bullets. Yeah, I know it's insane. Insane. And that's for an established seller, seven figure seller. And I was just like, Sheesh. mind blown. Right. No. So test your bullets. <laughs> That's yeah. all I can say. My obvious test question your, with that is what did you do? Test your bullets. Um, okay. So in terms of SEO, we have like a in-depth six step process that we actually walk you through in the mini audit, yeah. but it just shows like all the six best practices, all the things you would think about, right? It's like, reverse ASIN of your competitors. It's making sure that you've thought through all the different angles of how people may or may not search. Um, in addition to languages, in addition to um, just the strategy of main product versus variant products and how you're distributing your keywords and just all of, all of those like nitty gritty things that you need to be considering. Um, that's kind of the, the lens that we look through in those steps. Yeah. Also cross-referencing off Amazon data. So like the data that we're pulling from a third party, like a helium 10 or a data dive mm -hmm. versus your own internal data, your PPC reports, your, um, your brand analytics. Like we need to be cross referencing all of that data to make sure that we're putting in the best of the best. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then making sure it has the right tone and, and the right positioning and that you're using every single bullet in a meaningful way, in a structured way that actually makes sense for your product. Yeah. So from there, that's, that's SEO. Um, it can get, I mean, you can do a whole course on SEO, but yeah. in a nutshell, we're really wanting to make sure that you've maximized all of that critical space because that's, what's going to get you that step number one, which is getting found. And then once, once you're showing up though, that's where like my favorite step comes in. Yeah. This is the, the main image. So yeah. for me, this is like where I think still there's like the lowest hanging fruit. There's not enough brands doing this. And if they are doing it, they're really not doing it well. Um, they're just like slapping text on it and trying to like do little janky maneuvers. But really what you can do with your main image is get creative and think through different, look at your competitive set of your product and how you're showing up against competitors. And then say, okay, what are all these guys doing well? What are they not doing so well? And then go look at a different category, different from yours, similar, but different and get ideas, get the wheels spinning and come up with like three different options of like, okay, we could show, um, we could show this product at this angle with the shadow, with this kind of post edit. We can make this high res and do a render. We can make it glossy, like all, all these different ideas, take three completely different concepts for what you want to test that can help you get more clicks. They should be totally different from one another. Once you have those concepts, you test them in a tool like PickFu to understand what's working, what's not working. What are they saying? What's the why behind people's choices? You can make the images even better. And once you have one that you're very confident in, then you run your Amazon experiment and validate it on Amazon. And that's where we're seeing really incredible results. I'm just going to pull up um, this really quick so I can tell you what the actual results are for mm -hmm. um, for these tests right now, which is crazy. Yeah. No, they're very cool. There's a lot more creativity that you can apply to a main image. I think that than a lot of people will realize they kind of get limited to think, well, there's only so many angles I can show my product in. But yeah. as you said, if you look through search results, look through categories, there are ways that you can position, use packaging, use colors, mm -hmm. use props. There's there's lots more you can do, isn't there, than, than most yeah. people do. So for reference, title tests right now, our brands are seeing anywhere from 25% increase to 589% increase in sales. Wow. For main images though, which I think is the lowest hanging fruit, remember like changing the title is easy. It, like mm -hmm. that's, okay, that's of all the things, it's super easy. The next easiest thing is the main image, which not a lot of people are doing. And that we're seeing 10% to 160% increase in sales. And I think that number is gonna go up even higher. Like this mm -hmm. is, we're just like, 
the tip of the iceberg, right? And remember, yeah. each one of these changes that you're making to increase your sales, they stack one on top of the next, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So let's say you see 500% increase with your title, and then you see another 150 with your main image, and then you see, you know, like, these are the incremental changes that you need to be thinking about throughout the year to make sure that your content is staying above the competition. Yeah. You sound like you're testing more than a lot of other people I would speak to, um, which is obviously why you're getting good results because it's so important. But how, how much are you, te- like how frequently are you changing something? How much is too much? Is there such a thing? So I look at it as like, for most brands when they're starting out, it's really an 80-20. Like you mm. can do 80% of the lift up front. And then the 20% you're going to be doing throughout the year when you notice, you notice something comes in with the reviews and, and you need to fix that on one of your images so people understand it better. Or you realize that some word is converting really well and you need to move that into your listing from your PPC or different insights that you're going to pick up as you, as you go on in time, right? Uh, but as brands start to develop a catalog, they go into a different category of testing, right? And those are the brands that we work with that are basically, um, they're always testing. Like mm. they are testing nonstop throughout the year. So by the time their busy season comes, they are ready. Nobody can touch them. And so an example of a brand we just worked with recently, we basically gave them like, this is your whole, whole setup that we gave you right now. Um, but because they're an established seller and they have a full slew of products, we're basically building out, this is version two of what it should look like in the next few months after you guys get a few more content pieces that we're missing. And this will be version three in the next quarter after that, once you're done testing these elements and we know the winning, the winning elements from here, you're going to do these changes. And so yeah. they have their whole roadmap of testing for the next two quarters yeah. or even more, yeah. you know? That's that's the kind of detail that you should be doing in terms of testing when you have a catalog of products. If you yeah. have less than five products, you probably don't need to be as granular as that. Mm. Um, or if your products are not in the million dollar range, it's probably mm. you don't need to be spending your time there. It's like mm. do the eighty percent and move on to to yeah. traffic. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's some really good context. I, yeah. I think it's really important for people to get that mindset, though, of be testing throughout the year where it's applicable because a lot of people will wait until a few weeks before Q4 or Black Friday's coming yeah. up, you know, or Prime oh. Day's coming up. What do I what do I do to my listing? Oh. And it's, it's too late, right? It's already too late. You should have been doing this. I don't this even – don't touch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if, yeah. Well, if you're – if if you – we don't recommend changing – um If you're within a week of the holidays, that's for sure. Because the last thing you want to do is break something on your listing and be running to Amazon, begging for them to fix it before the holidays. And they're not going to pay attention to that. They're working on other things, you know? So you definitely don't want to be messing around with your listing and and do something that could jeopardize your sales. Um, Now, if you have nothing to lose by updating your listing sure by all means go for it you know like if your listing's down anyways and you need to fix it or if your listing isn't getting any sales and you need to fix it Mm. go for it you know but right before the holidays no you should be preparing literally right now in this moment is when you should be preparing for it you should be preparing for q4 and q3 and if it's already q4 by the time you're watching this run (laughs) you should be (laughs) you should be getting all your content asap and i will say this For a lot of brands, they still see sales in January and February. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of wellness brands, they'll see things pick up well into January, February because people are getting into their like post-holiday mode of wanting to be healthy and buy wellness-oriented products. So you still have time. Yeah, and I tend to every year say to our community – once you know, either either at the start of the season for people that feel like they've missed it and they're, they're not quite ready or at the end of the season listen it comes around real quick again so the time to start preparing for it is, is right now whenever mm-hmm. whatever time of the year it is start preparing start getting ready because it, it comes around again and um you know i, I think was it picasso he said that you know the, the great art is not never completed only abandoned and i think that's the same with a, a good listing a good business is you you got to continue to test and evolve that listing you, you don't want to ever get to the point where you say okay my listing's done my business is fully optimized you've got to always yeah. be ready to keep keep optimizing home one great way that you can think about optimizing your content is a lot of brands are getting into ugc content now mm, so user generated yeah. content if you're getting into using influencers or user generated content, that is great pieces of content that you can be adding to your listings, whether that's in your storefront on mm-hmm. different sub pages or on your homepage of your storefront. 
um, or whether that's in your video shorts that are on your listing yeah. um, or on your product page. So um, I definitely think that there's there's ways that you can keep your content fresh. And yeah. like 1.0 is just getting all of the basics in place. Mm. 2.0 is is making that even better. It's like yeah. it's like how do we make sure that our content is is attracting attention and engaging yeah. and informing. And if we're not doing yeah. those three things, you're just not getting sales. Yeah. And thinking like a real brand owner, you know, I think that a lot of five years ago, if you just said UGC and put it on Amazon, people would have just looked at you strange and, and thought, well, I am just want to make sales on Amazon. Why am I going to bother with all that kind of stuff? But the, I, the brands that I see having the most success at the moment are those that see Amazon as a sales channel. You know, you're not running an Amazon business. Amazon is a sales channel and you need to do all of the things, collecting UGC, like you said, you know, building an audience, all of that stuff and, you know, make it, uh, you know, Amazon just part of that bigger ecosystem. Um, and it sounds like that's kind of uh, what, what you're working on as well. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, you mentioned there Helium 10 and Data Dive. Are you, are you still using both? Yeah, we use both. Yeah. Because data dive is definitely becoming stronger, and it's almost like it ca could replace Helium Ten. And they started using Jungle Scout data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, yeah. So yeah, I just wondered if you're still still using both. But that's, yeah, it's good to know. Yeah, we use both. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, and then um, final question. Then obviously, once someone's on the page, you mentioned um, you know improve, improving click through yeah, rate with third the main step. image. Um, but once we get to that final step, and they're uh, they're ready with their credit card loaded up, how do we get them to make the decision to were, buy? Were people worried we were going to leave them hanging? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <Part laughs> Go three. to part two to learn the third <laughs> <Yeah>. step. <laughs> uh, okay, so third step, you've gotten found. They're they're inside your listing. They clicked on your main image because it's amazing because it has some eye candy on it, and you got them in there. Um, once they're in your listing. I'll say it again, every single image should be serving a function. So if you think through what are the top selling points, that you know you need to get across in five seconds before they bounce from your page. Like let's say they're going to spend a maximum of like 20 seconds on your page and they have a chance to just skim things. What are the main things that need to happen? Because I think where a lot of brands go wrong to, to, to go back to the point of what I see things, um, what I see brands making mistakes on is they try to stuff every single detail about their product in these images. And then it ends yeah. up just looking like a hodgepodge of different fonts, different colors, different, different um, things that they're trying to say all at once. And really we need to think about hierarchy on our images, like having really big headers, a few tiny things we're pointing out in the image and that's it. You know, a beautiful image that actually conveys shows the product in use um, shows the product um you know, there's really like, I have a list of like the types of images that perform well on Amazon. Um, I don't know if there's a download for that on my website, but um, anyways, every image you should be thinking through, like, could it be an us versus them? Like, how does your product differentiate from the competitors? How do people mostly use our product? How, what are the top questions they have about our product? What are the, what are those selling points? And make sure that you do one selling point per image. That's it. Not not five, not six, like one thing that you're trying to convey per yeah. image. And we're doing yeah. that across your product images and you're doing that in your A plus content. Um, one big mistake I see with A plus content. A plus content is the section that's below the fold that mm -hmm. has um, that has like different images once you scroll down on, on the product page, right? Yeah. And what you'll see with a lot of brands that did their 1.0 of a plus content is it almost looks like they copy and pasted things and they just like picked random modules. Mm -hmm. Um, and by modules, I mean like the templates that Amazon gives you and you upload the images to these templates or these shapes and the Amazon gives you all these different shapes that you can use. So why not? Right? Well, what happens with a lot of brands is they end up, um, just piecing together all of these different things that don't really go together in the first place. And so all the shopper sees, it's just a bunch, like just a hot mess of like text and like squares. And you're just like, what am I looking at? You know, and, and I don't want to read this. And then you just go down to the reviews, right? So really the A plus content, if you think about it, is the last chance that you have to convert the shopper before they get to the reviews. It's your last chance. So if that's your last chance, rather than overwhelm them with a bunch of text, we should be thinking about that section as a landing page. And you can do this with basic and premium A plus content. Our strategy for this is that you stack just big banners, one on top of the next, 
make it look like one big large image. If you have basic A plus content, you would uh, put a three part um, SEO module is what we call it underneath those stacked banners so that you do get some text in there for SEO relevance. And then yeah. anchor your content with a um, cross sell comparison grid, right? Mm -hmm. So you have three different types of modules. Let's say you have up to seven is the max. Five of them are stackable banners. So you're just like creating this huge image that takes up the whole screen and mm -hmm. that gets them to stop and take in two or three more points before they get to your reviews. And if you have premium A plus content, you do the same thing, but it's even better because you have scrolling carousels and, and hotspots and different things, different videos you could put in there. So, um, yeah. yeah. That's really, um, that was gonna be my question, but you've answered it for me already, is how do you differentiate between the images and the A plus content? Because exactly that, I see so many people just copy it over and you've answered it you know, powerfully there. That's um, you know, really, really helpful. And um, and also answers another question is because we've sort of flip-flopped at times back between those kind of stacked images and then the uh, more sort of written content because you want all the keywords in there, but you give a perfect solution there. And so um, you kind of just nailed it all on the head, really. I think you, you have to remember to, if you have a highly technical product, I wouldn't do the stackable banner. So if you have like an electronics product that yeah. maybe maybe needs more SEO keywords or more explanation on the details and the specs, <laughs> uh, maybe you do want to have a couple more of those banners that have specs listed out. But mm -hmm. but again, specs can even be designed into your creative. Yeah, um, sure. You can use with every image that you're uploading, you can use the alt text to put in your SEO keywords. And for mm -hmm. a lot of brands, that's all they need. You know, yeah, yeah. they don't need to. I mean, I, I look at the it's like weighing searchability versus um, converting, right? Yeah. And so once they're in your listing, we obviously want to convert. So we don't want to, like, it, you want to figure out that balance for your product. Oh, sure. For sure, yeah. 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 No, that's good. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, but have you got any brands that you look to as an inspiration if you've got a new project, new client? Are there some go-to brands you look at and think, oh, man, these guys are nailing their creatives on Amazon? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, Is it, I mean, it's fine. I you feel, you know, no, there's not one. I'll tell you why. Because, so what we have is we have like a swipe file, which if you follow me on TikTok, you can download the swipe file, I believe, which has like all of the favorite pieces that we found from brands. What I've noticed is that most brands, they have like either amazing A plus content, but then their product images are lackluster or vice versa, or mm -hmm. they have like, a really killer brand story section. And then they like, it's like they forgot about their A plus content or it's like one piece of it, right? So what we do is we kind of take the best of the brand stories and we put them all in a swipe file so that our creative directors can see like, what are the, we all share this with each other too. Like they find ones, I find ones and we all have like our favorites listed in this document where we can kind of see, okay, these are the best across lots of different categories and all the different ideas. And that's what gets the wheels spinning. So I don't think that one brand is necessarily doing the best job. I will also say that if you Google best storefronts on Amazon or best A plus content on Amazon, you will see the worst examples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like they show like yeah. Sony and like these like big yeah. brands that like literally their teams have not invested time and effort into Amazon as much as they have on their own websites so i just don't even think they're good examples to use in the first place um but in in general i would say um pet category and cpg category are probably leading the charge when it comes to creative content cpg is a, it's like food products specifically if you can't smell it and you can't taste it you need to have amazing packaging amazing visuals like people need to really understand it to buy it um, whether it's going to go in their household, in their kitchen and feed their family. Right. So yeah, I think that sure. that category is always pushing the limits and pets yeah. as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Good. Great thoughts. Um, is there anything, I feel like we've covered a lot today, but is there anything I haven't asked that you feel would be good to add before we finish? No, go check out our work at mindfulgoods.co. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> get yeah, a, get a mini on it. Yeah, 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 they no, can definitely. go to mindfulgoods.co, follow us on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, um, and yeah, we have, um, we actually on our website right now, there is a tutorial showing you how to unlock premium A plus content. If you haven't unlocked premium A plus content and your brand registered, you should have it unlocked by now. And it's actually, if you don't, it's actually really easy. It's a really, really easy two-step workaround. And so I just shared 
in a video tutorial exactly how to do it. You don't pay for it. It's totally free. Just go to my website and you'll see a pop-up that says unlock your premium A plus content. It'll show you the videos and you can do that. Very cool. That's a super useful resource. So thank you for that. And thank yeah. you for coming on the show. It's been uh, you know a, a great episode where you demonstrated that you clearly got a lot of skin in the game here. So thank <laughs> you for taking the time out. And um, Of course. Thanks yeah. for having me. No, it's a pleasure. Looking forward to following your journey as well and seeing, um, seeing it continue to grow. So um, yeah, appreciate you coming on. Likewise. Thanks, Ben. Good stuff. Well, thanks, guys, for listening. I assure you that you got a lot of value out of that. Uh, Daniela really knows her stuff and some actionable tips to go away and implement in your business, I'm sure. Thanks for being with us. If you have enjoyed this episode, as always, please do give it a like, a subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode, same time next week. Take care. Bye-bye.